All right, let's get, let's get started. Uh, our first speaker is paranormal investigator Joe Nickel. Oh, maybe it does work. Oh, okay. Well, I, um, I'm a paranormal investigator, and I thought maybe you'd be interested in how I became that way. I was resident magician at the Houdini Hall of Fame for three years, and during the course of that, got to know the amazing Randy and other magicians. And I thought it would be wonderful fun to investigate the paranormal like Randy was doing. I already had an interest, and uh, I began with the ghost at McKinsey House, a, a uh, famous haunted house in Toronto where late at night people would hear footsteps on the stairs, and the house was locked and there was no one in the house. Do you need any more proof of ghosts than that? <laughs> oh, no, right, this is a skeptical audience. Oh, that's, uh, okay, okay, I just forgot for a moment. So I, um, I went on scene and investigated and found that next door to the house, in the building next door, about 40 inches away, was a parallel iron staircase and a late night cleanup crew. <laughs> and that was my first big solved paranormal mystery and from then on I, I thought, this is what you do. You have to actually go on scene and investigate and if you do, People will believe you, and they will love you for it. <laughs> well, not so much. But one of the things, one of the reasons that I think so many of the paranormal investigators have been magicians, Houdini, Randy, moi, and many others, is because they are familiar with the illusions involved. Let me, let me introduce you to the word illusion. This looks like a pair of scissors. Would you agree? Nods your heads, yes. Okay. Yes, looks like a pair of scissors. This looks like a piece of rope. Looks like the rope has two ends. Looks like it has one center. Looks like I'm cutting said rope. Would you agree? Looks, looks like that. Now it looks like I'm tying the pieces of rope back together. But what you don't know is that I'm using something called a slip knot. It's called that because if you don't want it here, you could just slip it here. In fact, you could slip it here or slip it off, put it in your pocket, and the rope would be magically restored. <laughs> Okay, so that's, that's an illusion. And there, no extra charge for that, for the show. No extra charge. However, as you, as you may know, most people's talks are thinly disguised commercials for the books they've written. <laughs> this talk will be no exception. <clears throat> and after my talk, by the strangest paranormal coincidence, Copies of a couple of my books have appeared outside, and I will be available. Well, enough said about that. Not too much, but enough, perhaps, said. But I want to talk again about illusion before I start my particular, particular little show, because much of the paranormal involves not as some debunking skeptics think, rather stupid people who are liars and, and uh, just stupid yokels and so forth, but actually perfectly sane and sober and sincere and intelligent people who have seen something unusual. And these unusual things often happen to skeptics as well. And so I invite you to think about it. Uh, for example, Many people, and I've, I've been in their homes along the margins of Lake Okanagan in British Columbia or Lake Crescent, Newfoundland, or Lake Memphremagog in Quebec. Um, 
<clears throat> many people have seen a long-necked, multi-humped, undulating creature 30, 40, 50 or more feet long. Now, science says that these lakes, by and large, are about 10,000 or so years old. They're left over from the last ice age. And so any kind of ancient plesiosaur or other creature being in a 10,000-year-old lake is pretty much nonsense. And that such, such a lake would not support the necessary breeding herd of such animals. One animal can't perpetrate, perpetuate itself, but you would need a breeding population. And if you had many of these animals, eventually there would be uh, one of them, surely, that died and floated to the surface or washed up on shore. And yet, multiple witnesses across the globe have seen a creature, and I've talked to many of these people in their homes. So the nature of my business is to try to explain this, this irreconcilable difference. And in fact, I've come to realize that people have seen something that looks just like they described. And so, rather than the skeptic saying, oh yeah, they saw a lake monster, <laughs> I find that offensive. Or, yeah, they saw a lake monster. This is mean-spirited stuff, and if the idea is for the skeptic to show how much more superior and how much smarter he is than those little people, let me just say to you that I don't know any little people except skeptics who might misbehave like that. So, and the irony is that often the debunking skeptics who do that don't have the foggiest idea what the ex explanation is. Well, let me share that with you quickly. I just want to make this point before I go further. What I think many of these people have seen is a, a creature known as Lutra canadensis. It has a long neck. It's almost all neck. And it's not that long, but if you put one, two, three, four river otters swimming in a line, playing follow the leader as they do. Maybe a mother and pups or just playing follow the leader, just sporting. You can see how these, what looks like a three or four humped creature by an illusion being pre-programmed to think of a long creature, how this illusion could take place. I've been accused of suggesting that all lake monsters are otters, and of course I've said no such thing. Some are beavers. <laughs> <clears throat> Some are floating logs. Some are hoaxes. Not many of them are due to people drinking that I've found. So I just leave that with you. I want to talk now, I hope this is working, It is, okay. Let me get where I can see the screen myself. When I was uh, a magician and starting the paranormal, after a while I decided I really wanted to have a career doing this, and I decided that to, to really be effective, I needed to sharpen my detective skills. So I then went and worked with the world's oldest and largest private detective agency. I'm not supposed to use their name for publicity, but if you're asking, did their name start with a P? Do they go after the Jesse James gang? I can't say. <laughs> but much of the work that I did was undercover work. I would go in as a warehouseman, shipper receiver, stock clerk, what have you, and I would try to get on the inside of theft operations and one time I was a member of a theft gang. Work that either was not very exciting 
or was too exciting. <laughs> it was rarely in between. But I have seen from that vantage point, I've seen situations where you could have had all the security apparatus you wanted, guards, whatever, and we would have stolen you blind right under your nose and you would have smiled and signed everything as we did it. It's the undercover operative who can solve many crimes. So when I got into paranormal investigation, it turned out that, I mean, I could just be me and go somewhere and not say I was investigating and that would work until I started appearing on TV shows. <laughs> and then at Virgin Mary sites and other places, there would be exclamations like, happened once to me in front of some learning channel cameras, it's him! And it's pretty scary when there are thousands of people there that might, uh, might go after you. Um, so I started using uh, undercover techniques. Here I am at uh, Camp Chesterfield in Indiana. This is uh, a famous spiritualist site. And I went as this old codger, Jim Collins. I shaved off my mustache. I had just been on Dateline NBC where I helped them catch John Edward cheating. If any of you ever saw that episode. Yes, yes, that's right. <clears throat> right. Uh, if you read, don't buy the book, it's okay if you, you know, borrow a copy, read it in the bookstore, steal a copy, I don't care. But, no, no, I didn't say that. Uh, but if you turn to the, towards the back of the book, you'll see where John Edward talks about how Dateline NBC and Psychop and Joe Nickel uh, had their gotcha moment with him. <laughs> I think that's right, John, we got you. We got you cheating. That's right. I don't know why he put it in his book, uh, but... Maybe he's not as bright as some people think. Well, so this had just happened, and he was, uh, you know, Mr. Big at, at uh, Camp Chesterfield. So I thought, these people might have seen me. So I shaved my mustache and put on this uh, outrageous garb and limped painfully into Camp Chesterfield and told anyone who would listen about the death of my mother and how guilt-ridden and grief-stricken I was and yada, yada, yada. When I went into one of the churches at Camp Chesterfield, they had a, a reading. The people would be given, as you went in the door, you'd be given a, a slip like this. Please address your billet, a, a billet's a little slip of paper, to one or more loved ones in spirit, giving first and last names. Ask one or more questions and sign your full name. And I went, I went under the guise of Jim Collins. Little, little in-joke there, that was the name of Houdini's assistant. So Jim would, you know, painfully, painfully went back up to the door with his slip of paper and asked the lady, he said, now, tell me again how I'm supposed to fold this? And she said, oh, you fold it just in half, because if you fold it any other way, they won't read it. Well, I, I know... Uh, many ways to do the billet reading trick, and I was pretty well on to this one right away. Imagine that you've got a basket and we're collecting these slips from you. And suppose you fold yours into a triangle and you fold yours in half and half again and you pleat yours. If you hold one up to your forehead, you might recognize that's not mine. That's not mine. He doesn't want you to be able to do that. He wants them all to look alike. And while one is being drawn out of the basket and held up here, under cover of a podium, say, the other hand is doing this. Got it? So the medium was reading off this person and that person. People were crying and getting messages from their their dead parents and dead children. Powerful stuff. And I'm sitting in the back of the theater, of the church. I says, uh, I have a message for the Collins family. Here, here, back here, I say. Me, me. 
and begins to give the names of the Collins family members. I had written the question, Mother, will you be with me always? And he read off the names and he said, I have a message from your mother. She wants you to know <clears throat> she'll always be there for you. It was very moving. I was nearly on the verge of tears. <laughs> and then I remembered that at that time my mother was still alive <clears throat> and wasn't named Mrs. Collins. And I felt so much better because I had caught another trickster. And my expose in Skeptical Inquirer magazine resulted in about three mediums being ousted from the grounds of Camp Chesterfield, for which I am particularly proud. <laughs> my great friend and mentor, the amazing Randy, James Randy of JREF, he uh, used some undercover techniques to oust this guy, Peter Popoff. How many of you know the Popoff story? Oh, it's very well known. Okay. How many, well, maybe I should ask how many don't. Okay, quite a, enough. I'll give you the short version. Peter Popoff was a faith healing evangelist who could do, among other amazing things, not only heal people, but he could, he could have a word of, of power. God would speak to him. And so he might say, uh, I'm getting the name uh, so-and-so. And, <laughs> and I'm getting such and such an address. And I'm getting something, a problem with the eyes or what have you. And Randy and some others began to wonder why Popoff, if he could heal himself, needed a hearing aid. <laughs> and they thought a little bit about it, and they thought they might have something going, so they, they slip into the place undercover and using a radio intercept device. And Randy went on Johnny Carson's show, playing first to the audience this amazing demonstration of how he knew people's names and ailments and stuff, and he'd never met them. Knew him just like that. And then he played the same scene, letting the audience hear what you could hear in Popoff's hearing aid. And it sounded something like this. Hello, Petey, can you hear me? If not, we're both in trouble. And this was the voice of Mrs. Popoff backstage, reading from the prayer cards people had filled out prior to the show. Overnight, Randy put him out of business. Overnight. Years later, Popoff had made a recovery. I'll get to these points if you'll give me a moment. Uh, Popoff uh, made a recovery, and I decided to go and, and check him out. And uh, I can tell you that uh, he healed me of, uh, of a back injury, um, which I didn't have, and some other ailments that I, I didn't have, but, but I've, I've felt good ever since. Uh, <laughs> and he was not doing the, uh, the uh, famous trick anymore, so Randy stopped him from that. This is John of God. Do you know him? The Brazilian healer. And he appeared in Atlanta, and I was working at that time on a number of programs with National Geographic Television. I did maybe a dozen programs for Is It Real? Do you remember that series? And I was, maybe you remember me, I was the guy who would come on and say, no, it isn't real. <laughs> remember, remember that guy? Yeah, that was me. And um, the um, John of God was, uh, was up to his usual tricks there in Atlanta. And, oh, I don't, yeah, maybe I, there, there, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm one slide out of order. Sorry. Uh, can you find the undercover guy? <laughs> Is it the guy with the big beard? Is that, wouldn't that be a great, uh, great guy? No, that was actually just one of the people. This is me there in the ugly glasses, and there, there I am with the cane again. The cane's great if you're, if you're going to, you know, look pitiful. 
And uh, John of God would be psychically told by, by the spirits uh, what people's conditions were and so forth. And, you know, I was really impressed that, that the spirits did not whisper in his ear that I was a phony, that I was there under false pretenses, that I was trying to trap him, trick him, catch him. And I did manage to do that, and this was on National Geographic Television. Uh, now the one I, I slipped, Benny Hinn. Um, Benny Hinn is another faith healing evangelist. He studied under Catherine Kuhlman, the woman who worked miracles. Um, and I've been to Benny Hinn's concerts. He does, a, he does an amazing thing where he, he simply heals people out there. He says, uh, you know, someone over here is being healed of a back injury. Someone way in the back is being healed of witchcraft. You know who you are. <laughs> and so on. And then those people self-select, you see. They, he invites them up on stage, not to be healed. You see, they were already healed. And then he has them go under the power, which is just suggestion. You touch them, and they, they fall down. It's method acting. People know what they're supposed to do, and they do it. Well, this is Phil Jordan. Phil Jordan is a psychic detective and a, a psychic. You've maybe seen him on TV a few times. He's a, uh, a, an incredible guy who uh, can talk to the dead and get clairvoyant visions and so forth. What most of the psychic detectives are doing, this is just a great generalization, but what most of them are doing is a trick called retrofitting. They throw out a few clues. I see water. I'm getting, I'm getting the number seven. I see a tall structure. And the police invariably say, Frank, that mean anything to you? No, Charlie, I don't know what that is. That doesn't help me any. But when the police finally do find the missing person's body, or Then the psych, and, and, and these clues were never of any help. They're found by a tipster or a, a tracking dog or something. Afterwards, the psychic encourages the police to think, remember I mentioned water and they were found near a creek or a stream, a pond, a lake, the margin of an ocean, Riverside Drive, a water tower, remember the tall structure? You see how this works. And there were seven people in the search party. Remember seven? Or it was seven miles out of town, or the license, sheriff's license plate had ended in seven, or you, you see how this works. It fooled many otherwise sensible detectives, even with this trick. Well, anyway, Phil Jordan's fame rests on basically one case where basically what he did was he, he saw the missing boy who was still alive, Unfortunately, he saw him in an area that was the only area that hadn't yet been searched in the general area where the boy had gone missing. And he was actually nowhere near the boy when the boy was actually found by the searchers, but was in a ravine, uh, kind of totally disconnected from the boy. So, so it doesn't look very amazing unless you hear him tell the story, and then it looks pretty impressive. Well, he, he set himself up with a hotel at Seneca Falls, in New York, and I, um, I decided to go in one of my makeovers and just take the measure of Phil Jordan. And I went as Johnny Adams, and that just indicates that I'm one person at this little table, Johnny Adams. And I went as a, you know, garrulous old guy with ugly teeth and so forth. I don't show pictures of all my garbs because then I can't use them anymore. So, so I, don't, I don't use them. But Anyway, uh, suffice it to say that, uh, that Johnny um, got a reading from Phil, and all, all Phil did was a generalized reading for some character like I was purporting to be. He said nothing of any meaning to me. For example, I learned in 2003 that I had a daughter I'd never known about. And I inherited a beautiful daughter and two grandsons overnight. 
And I thought back on that for 36 or 7 years. No fortune teller, no medium, no psychic, no tarot card reader, no astrologer. And I've been, believe me when I tell you, I've been to many of these people. Not one of them told me that. Discouraging, isn't it? And Phil didn't know better. And he signed his, uh, signed his book for his friend, uh, his friend Johnny. Well, disconcerting. Here's another one of the fortune tellers. This one's in Mexico. And this is a tarot card reader in uh, Tijuana. I had gone on this one uh, as a um, terminally ill a prostate cancer patient. I, in fact, actually had a prostate cancer scare once, and it was a role I could, I could uh, play rather effectively. Um, and he, again, he directed his reading to that false statement. In other words, this is one way to test psychics is, is to use a false persona, a false story, and then see if they spot it, if they buy into it, how psychic are they? Shouldn't, shouldn't Phil Jordan have said, I'm getting strange feelings over here. I'm, I'm seeing a large wooden nickel. What does, what, does, what, does that, <laughs> what does that mean? You know, or something. Or I'm getting bad vibrations. There's trickery in the air. No, no, they just happily, you know. Anyway, so here I am at a Tijuana clinic that sells hope. Yes, they sell hope. And I was there to see if they would sell me uh, things that are illegal here, like Leotril, and they would sell you pretty much anything you wanted. And I simply went in. I had a friend who was hovering over me, and I played the part of someone who was, uh, had a diagnosis of cancer and, uh, and in fact, uh, lowered my voice. And with my voice trembling, I confessed to the person there that I was, I was scared. And it, it really is very frightening to see how people can be um, preyed upon this way, that false hope, uh, all kinds of just bogus therapies, that prayer therapy, for example. Um, and you pay for this. Well, the way to find out some of these things is to go, to go undercover, I think. No particular disguise there because I wasn't expecting to be recognized in Tijuana. Here is a stigmatist, Lillian Burness, and I showed up at one of her uh, bleedings and I shook her bloody hand. And as she, uh, we stood in line to meet her and talk to her, uh, she was hugging the lady in front of me. So she was presenting her hands, you see, pretty much right under my nose. I almost pulled out my magnifying glass, uh, but I didn't. But I got a really good look at her wounds, and as far as I'm concerned, they were self-inflicted. And uh, they were only on the backs of her hands, not the palms, only on the tops of her feet, not the soles, and just a little nick or two around the forehead. And they, the blood dried up. Uh, she, in other words, she was already bleeding when she walked out in front of the crowd. There was nothing mysterious. Wouldn't it have been amazing to see her unblemished and right before, like, me, if, right while I'm talking to you, if you saw a wound open and blood come out, wouldn't that be impressive? Oh, you'd think I was doing a magic trick, but you'd be impressed, wouldn't you? <laughs> right? No, I'm not going to do it. Am I? But anyway. And here I am. I appear to be uh, worshipfully, worshipfully venerating the holy blood of Christ at Bruges, Belgium. But take a closer look. Am I really venerating the vial of holy blood? Or just getting a good look? <laughs> That's right. This is for my book, uh, The um, Relics, Relics of the Christ. And I stood in the pilgrim line just as another pilgrim. And I needed a, a second look, so I just went, got back in line. And if, and if you're holding up a banknote, uh, you can go through the line often. And just wave some money. <laughs> money well spent. I could see from the, the look of the blood that it was waxy, that it was still bright red. It was, in other words, looked everything unlike real blood. 
And now I want to take you to Patricia Bartlett's place at the uh, Lilydale Spiritual Center. It's, it's like, I'm just checking my time, Lilydale is like Camp Chesterfield. It's a place where the spiritualists uh, have little cottages. It's a really scenic place in uh, upstate New York. I go there often. Uh, the mediums usually uh, turn away from me angrily. Um, some of the other people, though, will come up and hug me. I had a very good friend there, Joyce LeJudas, in the museum. And I had special museum privileges. I could go and take the rare Davenport Boys scrapbook and open it up, take it out of the display case and study it. They wouldn't let the mediums touch it, but I could do that. Because she felt that I was an open-minded skeptic, and she was an open-minded believer, and we were, we were very good friends, and I, I miss her very much. She's dead now. But her, her successor said to me, he said, I want you to know that you still have museum privileges here, because he said, I know that's what Joyce would have wanted. He said, I know you don't believe she's still with us. But I, I, I believe she is, and I, I know that's what she would want. And I said, well, I, I, you're right, I don't believe that, but I, but I really am touched by the sincerity of your, your feeling. And so I think sometimes we can be friends with people on the other side. I'm not talking about the other side. I'm just, I just, <laughs> no, no. But uh, in this particular case, um, I was not so well known at this time at, uh, at Lilydale, and, and I checked out this woman. I could tell she didn't know me from, from Adam, and so I made arrangements. She said, come back when it's off season, and so I went back off season when it was not so busy. And what she does, or did, she's also passed away, but Patricia Bartlett was a, a spirit artist. She did spirit drawings. Uh, she wasn't a very good artist. But, but she did, she would, she would, if you were sitting down, if you came for a spirit drawing, it was disconcerting. It was sort of like if you were at Coney Island, you know, they look at you and they, they sketch you, right? Well, not, not, not the spirit artists. They're looking right over your shoulder and you're, you're going, it's a little disconcerting. And they're drawing the imagined spirit guide. And they're usually Native Americans, as you see, because they were so close to nature. Spirit Guide Portraits, $50 by appointment. And I thought, yeah, that's for me. That's for me. I have a spirit picture to put in my office, among my other bric-a-brac. <laughs> so I went, and on the way there, I made up a story. And as, as Mrs. Bartlett, who was the sweetest little old lady, just really charming, she got her pastels ready, and I said, you know, ma'am, I think I saw my spirit guide once. Oh, she said, perking right up. I said, yes, it was a terrible time in my life, and I was blah, blah, blah. And I, I woke up one night, and I saw this Native American standing by my bed. I'll never forget it. He had three yellow feathers standing up. And then I don't, he said, everything will be all right, my son. And I don't remember what happened after that. I must have gone back to sleep. She said, that's it. That's what they do. <laughs> that's, that's your spirit guide. Yes, you did see your spirit guide. And she said, would, would you like for me to, to draw your spirit guide for you? I said, it would mean a lot to me. Did I mention the three yellow foot? And <laughs> so she says, now I'm seeing, and she looks off and she says, I'm seeing a, a big, strong Yes, and I'm nodding, yes. She said, no, I don't see his hair. Um, I don't see it. I, no, I said, I see it more. And uh, pretty soon she said, yes, I think I, I think I have him. She said, we can call him, we can give him a name. We're permitted to do that. We could call him Yellowbird. I said, oh, for the three yellow feathers. Yes, we could call him Yellowbird. So she proceeded then to draw, and uh, I want you to see my, uh, this is my spirit guide, isn't that sweet? Now, now here's the thing, here's, here's the thing I want you to think about for a moment. Did we prove that she's a fraud? 
No, because we don't know whether she said, oh yeah, okay, the guy wants a Native American with three yellow feathers, I'll collect it and collect the sucker's money and get $50. Or did she, being perhaps a fantasy-prone personality, could she just picture Yellowbird when I described him? Just picture it in her sweet little mind and just see him right there and draw him, which, which is the case. I don't know, but I'm convinced that Yellowbird uh, exists no more than he did before I drove there. <laughs> Finally, I just want to mention a couple of things from um, recent, uh, recent endeavors. I think my time is, is about running out, is that right? Am I doing just fine? Don't wake her up. No, she's really doing well. <laughs> I, got a call, I got a call a few years ago from a Hollywood scriptwriter, and he wanted to interview me, and we had some conversations, and they were doing some kind of movie, had an idea, and eventually we began to be getting requests for copies of the magazine and some things from Skeptical Inquirer, and so our executive director, Barry Carr, said, uh, you know, he emailed him, what are you doing? And he said, oh, we're, we're making a movie with Hilary Swank. And um, Barry said, well, you, they told a little about the movie. It's about a, a miracle detective, a skeptic. Barry said, well, you ought, to, you ought to get Joe Nichols' book, Looking for a Miracle. Did, did I mention that's on sale out, out there? <laughs> I, may, I may, have, may have neglected to mention that. And so they said, oh, yes, we have several copies. Hillary is reading it right now. <laughs> so eventually, uh, Warner Brothers had me down on the set. I got to meet Hillary. I got to watch a little bit of the filming. And it was awful. Uh, <laughs> it, was, it was just really awful. But Hillary Swank is just something else. She is really, she's a, you know, just as good as we all thought she was uh, in, in a very, very bad movie. But she's, she's playing a, a character uh, based on my work. Um, I just wanted to, to just show you just for a moment. Uh, <clears throat> and I think, you can, I think you can see why she would, she would be chosen to play me. Um, I think so. Thank you very much.